Good afternoon. I'm Raleigh Flynn. I'm the president of the Foreign Policy Research Institute. And this afternoon, we have a wonderful conversation with uh, John Nagel, who's a senior fellow and the headmaster of the Haverford School, and uh, Robert D. Kaplan, our Robert Strauss Who Pay Chair in Geopolitics at FPRI. Um, they're going to be talking about the geopolitical challenges for the new Biden administration. Um, before I introduce uh, our moderator, I just want to uh, go over some of the housekeeping. The Q&A button at the bottom of your screen is where you enter your questions. Please go ahead and start doing that at any point during the talk, about halfway through. We'll turn it over to the audience questions. Please put them in the Q&A, not the chat. If you put them in the chat, we might miss them. Um, in the chat box, uh, we have a few informations, uh, a, a bit of information on how to join FBRI. If you're not a member, we encourage you to do that, um, as well as uh, Robert Kaplan's upcoming article in Orbis. We have a link to that as well. And uh, if you have any technical difficulties, please let us know also via the chat. Uh, and, and don't wait till the end to give us feedback that you couldn't hear, hear. Please tell us in the moment and we can try to help you with that. Um, we'll be recording this this afternoon. Um, so if you missed any part of it or want to send it to your friends, you'll be able to do that as well. Um, so, without further ado, let me introduce um, our moderator, Dr. John Nagel, who, as I mentioned, is the ninth headmaster of the Haverford School, and he's a senior fellow at FBRI. He's also a 20-year veteran of the U.S. Army, and he led a troop, troop, troop tank platoon in Operation Desert Storm, and he's also the author of Knife, Knife Fights, A Memoir of Modern War, and Learning to Eat Soup with a knife. He was also on the writing team that produced uh, the counterinsurgency field manual. Uh, without further ado, let me turn it over to you, John. Thanks, Raleigh. And, and most importantly, today I am a longtime admirer of our speaker today, Bob Kaplan, and former uh, co worker uh, with Bob at a previous think tank in a previous life. And maybe we'll get him to talk about that a little bit. Bob Kaplan, as you all know, is the best-selling author of now 19 books on foreign policy, on travel. They've been translated into a bunch of languages. Uh, he's, he's got a book called The Good American coming out just next month. He wrote The Revenge of Geography, Asia's Cauldron, Monsoon, The Coming Anarchy, Balkan Ghosts. He writes cheery, upbeat books about nice things that happen in the world. Bob currently holds the Robert Strauss Hupe Chair in Geopolitics here at the Foreign Policy Research Institute. For 30 years, he reported on foreign policy at the Atlantic. He was a member of the Pentagon's Defense Policy Board, the US Navy's executive panel, and foreign policy twice named him one of the world's top 100 global thinkers. Bob's gonna take us on a tour of the world and provide us with his insights. And I'm gonna ask him to begin by thinking about the Biden foreign policy team that is now taking shape in particular with the rumored announcement of former General Lloyd Austin as Secretary of Defense. Well, thank you, John. It's a great pleasure to be here. And we weren't exactly colleagues. We, you were my boss, actually, um, at, at the Center for a New American Security in, it, um, in the previous decade. And you were a great boss. So I hope I satisfy you today. Um, in terms of the Biden foreign policy team, uh, basically what you've got is the best of the democratic establishment, more or less. Um, it's a normal team. They're all people who Biden feels close with or are comfortable with. Um, so, so Anthony Blinken, the new incoming Secretary of State, is an extension of Biden himself, uh, um, in a way. The two have worked together for so many years. Uh, this is very much of a chummy team kind of like the George H.W. Bush team where he brought in his friends James Baker and Brent Scowcroft. Um, and, uh, and when John Pat Tower couldn't be confirmed as Secretary of Defense, brought in Dick Cheney, who did a, a reasonable job as Secretary of Defense, who was also close to the elder Bush at that point. So the elder, the reason I'm saying this is because the elder Bush team, when they came into office, they were criticized that they did not have a vision. 
And it turned out that they didn't need a vision because their inbox kept getting filled up with historic events. Tiananmen Square, the collapse of the Berlin Wall, Saddam Hussein's invasion of Kuwait. And the elder Bush went down in history, I believe, as one of the greatest one-term presidents in foreign policy because his team handled those events perfectly and counterintuitively. They were very unpopular at the time that he did it with the elite. The elite was enraged that they did not break diplomatic relations with China after Tiananmen Square. The elite was enraged that the elder Bush did not make a victory lap around Eastern Europe when the wall fell, you know, because he didn't want to upset the Soviets too much. And, and the elite was divided over whether he should have done anything for Kuwait or he should have gone all the way to Baghdad. The point is that tough decisions often anger the elite. And, we, and I think the inbox for the incoming Biden administration is going to be full. It is going to fill, fill up because COVID-19 has put history on fast forward in the developing world. Um, it's, you know, it, it's added to uh, economic catastrophe and other things that the developing world doesn't have the Federal Reserve to bail it out um, as we've had. So we're going to see really tumultuous events over the next four years. And the Biden team will be judged more by how it handles those events than by any vision it may have. Having said that, I think that there's um, that the Biden team may have gotten off on the wrong start on one thing. It, you know, it's telegraphed that it wants to do more diplomacy and no military, essentially. That's a good policy to keep private, to tell your cabinet at the first cabinet meeting. Um, you know, to tell people one-on-one, -on -one, but it's not something you should make public because all that'll happen is you'll be tested because people like Vladimir Putin and Recep Tayyip Erdogan in Turkey love pushing into voids. And if they sense more voids, they will keep pushing. So, you know, doing diplomacy instead of military makes perfect sense, but don't advertise that essentially. So that, that could be a problem. And of course, there's the surprise announcement of the defense secretary. Um, you know, most people in Washington knew Michelle Flournoy. You and I worked for her. We knew her. She was the odds on favorite. And Biden went with a general. He went with an army general at a time when the real military challenge to containing China is air, is air and Navy. It's air and sea. So an army general is, a diff is an awkward appointment for that. Also, the Pentagon is a fairly sick institution. It needs reform. The procurement process is broken or half broken. Um, the Pentagon has to find a way to better coordinate and get along with Silicon Valley to develop the next, next generation of digital and cyber weapons. These are not something that an army general in the course of his career gets to deal with. So it seems like it could, you know, it's an odd choice, I would say, in that sense. And again, with, there's the whole issue of should we have generals as Secretary of Defense, you know, um, which has already been raised. But I think I've said enough on the Biden team at this moment. Thanks, Bob. We may come to more of that as we take audience questions. But let's, let's stay with uh, General Austin for a moment, uh, probably most famous for his uh, leadership of the Central Command. And can I ask you to think about CENTCOM? To tell me about the Middle East and what you see the prospects for the Middle East uh, and the problems there that the Biden team is going to face. Right. Well, the first thing to mention is that the, 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 the peace accord between Israel and the United Arab Emirates and Bahrain and partially with Sudan and in fact, spiritually though unofficially with Oman, with Kuwait and with a whole other bunch of Sunni Arab states that have spiritually given up the struggle with Israel is big news. It's bigger news that, than, than the Israeli-Egyptian uh, peace treaty or the Israeli-Jordanian peace treaty. Why? because those peace treaties of 1979 and 1994 were cold, 
pieces. Neither party really liked each other. They were all bribed by the United States to make peace. It didn't develop into mass Israeli tourism to Egypt. Um, they're, they're either, I don't think Mubarak went once to Israel during his whole tenure as president of Egypt. However, the deal Israel has made with the Arab Gulf countries and unofficially with others is a very, very warm piece. There's going to be cooperation across the board on digital, cyber, tourism. Uh, the Israeli and UAE foreign ministers walked hand in hand at the Holocaust Memorial in Berlin. These were things that Israel never did with the Egyptians or the Jordanians. So this is a real unofficial alliance that is being formed. And it's being formed not because two sides like each other, but because they have a common enemy, Iran. And Iran is on the ropes from Trump sanctions from mishandling of the COVID-19 crisis inside Iran, from their inability to protect Qasem Soleimani, who is like a Sean Connery-like man for all seasons in Iran, who is both geopolitically and strategically and tactically brilliant, who spoke fluent Arabic, even though he was Persian. And it was like a one-man show orchestrating the Iranian empire of sorts, of proxy military throughout the Near East. His loss was a big, big deal. Um, and so Iran is on the ropes. And so the question becomes, what does the Biden administration do? Um, I think it would be a mistake to rush into re to, to completely restarting the, uh, the, the, uh, the Iran nuclear deal. Um, they should buy their time, go slow, uh, let the, you know, because the Iranians felt if they could just outlast Trump, they would be in the clear. Uh, but let them be more desperate. It's a good negotiating tactic. The Iranians are the weaker party at this point. And, and it's not just nuclear missiles. It's precision guided. It's not just nuclear bombs. It's precision guided missiles that the Iranians are want to deploy. And the Israelis, frankly, are more worried about those than about the nuclear weapon because the Iranians would never use a nuke on Israel. They would use it for leverage in the region, uh, most likely. So Biden's, the Biden team will probably have a debate, uh, you know, um, a very spirited debate over how to get back to some sort of agreement with Iran without dialing the clock back four years, which is impossible. How to, though they'll never admit it publicly, but how to build on the leverage that Trump has um, developed. Um, um, and uh, so I think that also with the Middle East, um, keep in mind that, um, that this Saudi Arabia presently has the worst possible regime one could imagine, except for any other that would replace it. Um, so we have no choice but to get along with the Saudis. The, the American media despises the Saudis because of what they did to the Washington Post journalist, Jamal Khashoggi, murdering him in brutal, bestial form. But this is the reality. Uh, you know, we never liked the Saudis, but we have to get along with them. In fact, this, the, these Israeli peace deals with a number of Arab states would have been impossible if the Saudis had not given the green light to these Arab states. Um, so that um, getting along, we have to normalize our relationship with Saudi Arabia, as unpleasant as it may sound. Thanks, Bob. Maybe we'll get to uh, um, Iraq and Afghanistan a little bit in q and I will seed that, but I'm going to move on to... Um, can I say a word on that? Okay. Just, just briefly. Look, we've gotten our troop levels down, you know this better than I, from something like 132,000 in Iraq to 2,500. It's some similar precipitous drop in Afghanistan. To my knowledge, there's very few casualties. There are few and far between. We've gotten our casualties down, way down, so that nobody even covers it anymore, practically. Whether we leave completely, Afghanistan and Iraq next year or in five years, in terms of the, give under these circumstances, 
given the, the arc of history, is not going to make much of a difference, you, you know, in that sense. What's going to make a difference is can the Pentagon cooperate with Silicon Valley, you know, to rise up to the China challenge? Those kinds of things will make a difference. That's, uh, um, I would push back a little bit. I think if, uh, um, I think both of those very small uh, and uh, not very costly troop deployments uh, at the present time keep two governments in power that we would miss. That's true. That, that you know, we're keeping two friendly governments in power for actually very low cost. And the Iraqi government is actually a dream government when you look at the personalities of the prime minister and the president. Um, the Iraq, the Afghanistan government, less so. My worry about the Afghanistan government is it doesn't govern much. Uh, if we leave, it will it will not govern at all. Yeah. So so we'll 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 get the chance to talk more about that. But I'd like to turn to um, uh, a power that uh, is also struggling uh, severely, Vladimir Putin's Russia. Yeah. And and how how is how is Putin going to assess? the Biden team coming in, and Joe Biden himself, who we know as well. Yeah, look, US-Russia relations are dysfunctional. Russia has enough nuclear weapons to destroy America in 30 minutes. Again, like with the Saudis, we have to come to some sort of normalized relationship with Russia. But you do that by building leverage first, and then applying the leverage to come to some sort of uh, arrangement where you set parameters where the chances of an accidental war in the Black Sea or in the Baltic Sea is become much less than currently are. Because US and Russia or NATO and Russian forces are, are very worse close to each other. Uh, you know, you know fighter jets, buzzing ship, et cetera, et cetera. It's a very, very dangerous situation. Um, Putin, um, Putin's, uh, you know, has, you know, as I said earlier, he loves pushing into voids. And if the void is not filled, he keeps pushing. If the void is filled, he retreats a little bit. Putin is not an ir irresponsible ga gambler. He didn't go into Syria until several years after Obama indicated that he was not going to do so. And then he did so mainly with air components. Um, he didn't put significant numbers of ground troops there where you could get into a quagmire. And also, the deployment in Syria for the Russians really hasn't cost them that much. Um, they've learned a different lesson than we've learned in Iraq and Afghanistan. They've learned that the, the price of entry is relatively small. And as long as you don't have ground troops, you can withdraw at any moment. You can do so even if you don't solve the original problem. You don't, it's so what if Syria becomes another frozen conflict from the Russian point of view? Um, so, you know, this is what we have to contend with. The Russians' geographic space is like an arc that goes from the Baltics through Eastern Europe down to the Balkans into Syria, the old Soviet near abroad. And this is where Putin is pressing out into. Um, and, the, and the biggest issue about this, and this joins up with Europe and our allies, is that the Russians are building a second Nord Stream pipeline called Nord Stream 2, which brings Russian natural gas to Germany and France while bypassing Ukraine by going underneath the Black Sea, underneath the Baltic Sea. Um, and as long as the Europeans accept this, all the talk about a new invigorated alliance between the US and Europe uh, in the Biden administration is not going to amount to that much because the, the Russians will have a kind of hold over European ge geopolitics because they'll be because the Europeans will be dependent on Putin for natural gas. So that's where we are. We have to build leverage while stabilizing the U.S.-Russian relationship because we can't, we can't get rid of the regime. It is what it is. Uh, and while we're on Russia, I'm going to pick up a, a question from Thomas Meager, uh, who asks, 
What can the Biden administration do to get Crimea back into Ukraine's hands in view of the damage Ukraine's annexation has done to the European security order? Should we be, is, is our current policy of non-recognizing Crimea's annexation, is that sufficient under Biden? Um, I don't see how we get Korea back, uh, how we get Crimea back, uh, frankly. I don't see it being done. The Russians were never happy with Crimea being part of Ukraine. They were never happy. They had plans on the shelf for years about taking it back. Crimea gives it, Crimea dramatically improves the position of the Russian naval fleet in the Black Sea, which is Russia's entry point through the Bosphorus to the Mediterranean and the warm waters. You know, Crimea is not something we're going to get back because it means much, much more to Putin than it means to us. Uh, you know, at, um, at the end, and therefore he's willing to risk more because of it. Also, it was a big domestic gain for him when he annexed Crimea. That's not something he's in a position to give up because in the 21st century, John, dictators follow a public opinion polls. They care about public opinion. It's one of the complexities about being a dictator in the 21st century. You have to constantly monitor public opinion polls and, and annexing Crimea has done more for Putin in that department than many other things. I heard a little revenge of geography in that answer. Uh, I'm, I'm going to I'm going to stay with. Uh, um, uh, uh, I was going to move next to China, but Jerry Rubenstein is taking us there. How will the Biden team deal with China, both geopolitics and geoeconomics? And and um, on the the geopolitics, I'm going to note that, and I um, I'm sure you know this, uh, but it isn't just uh, Russia that the United States is trading paint with on ships and planes, but also the Chinese? Yeah. Um, first of all, we have to get our relationship with China. And I think the Biden team knows this and will work in this direction. They have to get our relationship with China back to move it from a pre-Cuban missile crisis level to a post-Cuban missile crisis level. The Cuban Missile Crisis of 1962 forced both superpowers, the U.S. and the Soviet Union, to stare into the abyss. And they didn't like what they saw. They saw the actual likelihood of nuclear war at a time when both sides had hundreds of hydrogen bombs. So when the Cuban Missile Crisis was over, you then had the hotline established, you had more summit meetings, you had strategic arms limitation talks, you had nuclear test ban treaties, you got all kinds of things that did not solve, and then eventually you got detente. But you got all kinds of things that did not solve any of the problems or disagreements between the two superpowers, but stabilized the relationship so that out, out and out great power war was much less likely to occur. And I think that's what the Biden administration needs and wants to do. You know, it's not going to cave into China but it will try to stabilize the relationship from the utter chaos of the Trump administration. Um, and, um, and, and, that, and, and I think that, and financial markets, by the way, will award Biden for that. You know, it, you know, you know, if, if six, seven months from now, there's a summit meeting, you know, the two sides agree to disagree, they have regular consultations that can be announced, things like that. Um, you know, so, so that's the first thing we have to do. The other thing is I see a problem, I didn't mention this at the beginning, between John Kerry's climate policy and, and what we want in the South China Sea. Because Kerry will not report to Secretary of State Anthony Blinken. He will report directly to the president himself. And Kerry is a master operator who is former Secretary of State. So the question becomes if he gets, he'll want to get concessions from China on climate and as, and as a and as a gift, maybe make some concessions to them in the South China Sea, which the State Department and the Defense Department will be against. So there's like a real possibility for confusion 
and real, you know, bureaucratic infighting uh, with this. Um, you know, there's a lot we can do with the Chinese, but the biggest, the big problem remains, which is that the Chinese are using a drip drop little, you know, strategy of microaggressions, take an island here, build a runway there, send an oil rig in, into Vietnamese waters, establish a government here. A lot of little things that are minor in and of themselves, but over a period of a decade, shift the balance of power in the South China Sea and also in the East China Sea as well. And if this hap also, we're having a debate over, uh, it's a, you know, it's a low key debate, but it's happening of whether the United States should defend Taiwan in the case of a, a, of a China attack. And as long as we have that debate, the, the Chinese will read that we are in strategic confusion and therefore it's okay for them to become more and more aggressive vis-a-vis -vis Taiwan. I think elite in Washington, if the administration came out unambiguously that we would have no choice but to defend Taiwan in the case of actual military aggression, the Chinese would actually back down, you know, and their policy might shift. Because it's not in the Chinese interest to have any kind of a military conflict with us over Taiwan, given how much gains they're making in the South China Sea precisely by avoiding a military conflict with us. The Chinese prefer microaggressions much more than an out-and-out an out -out conflict. Um, but the real danger here on China is that this is not the China of 15, 20 years ago. This is not the enlightened, collegial, risk-averse, uh, you know, benevolent authoritarian system of 15, 20 years ago that had friends at the business roundtable, friends in the Washington media, friends in Congress, or not friends, people they could deal with, say. This is a much harder edged, ideological, authoritarian regime built around one person with a cult of personality. Uh, is using Orwellian tools of technology to monitor his population, oppressing minority groups, so that China doesn't have any friends in Washington, John. So this makes the relationship really unstable. It's become ideological. By becoming ideological, it's become existential in a way. And so I think the Biden team may try to move in a direction of lowering the temperature because the incoming national security advisor, Jake Sullivan, has indicated that you need a foreign policy that the American people have an appetite for. Um, and I don't think the American people have an appetite for changing the regime in China. Well, that would be, that would be a big deal. I'm gonna take a smart question from William Thoyer from the chat. To more effectively engage both India and China, how can the US better position ourselves within Central Asian states like Kazakhstan and Bhutan, which has its own border issues with China. Yeah, um, India is another kind of regime that we increasingly don't like, but which we have no, no alternative but to deal with and cooperate with. The Indian repression of Muslims in Kashmir may actually be worse than the repression of Turkic Uyghur Muslims by China in Xinjiang in Western China, but it doesn't get as much attention in the news. Um, it's become a real nasty regime in New Delhi. I've interviewed Narendra Modi at length back in 2008 when he was state minister of Gujarat. Um, and I can tell you that this is a guy who is absolutely compulsive, driven, um, uh, you know, with just with tunnel vision, and he's absolutely committed to accomplishing every goal, and who also thinks geopolitically in a way that previous Nehruvian era Indian prime ministers did not, you know, did not conceive. They were more moralistic. They wanted third world anti-colonialism against the West. Um, Modi has no interest in, in any, it's, it's just a, it's a geopolitical board game for him. Um, uh, and he makes this clear. Um, here's the conundrum we're under. 
if, if our relationship with China deteriorates further and it really becomes unstable, India will move away from us and closer to China because it's on China's border. It cannot afford a, 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 you know, to have a, a military clash with China. It's been hurt enough by these border clashes in the Himalayas uh, that have been happening. But if our relations with China improve, India will become more of an honest middle-level middle, middle level power siding close to us. Um, so it's, you know, it's, it's complicated. In Central Asia, uh, it's really a contest not with India, uh, at, but between China and Russia. Uh, remember, central, former Soviet Central Asia, the lingua franca is still Russian. The Russians still provide a significant amount of security protection, and the Chinese are buying up the place. You know, uh, in, in the bazaars and everything, it's all Chinese goods. But the Chinese and the Russians have come to most vivende over Central Asia. Putin would much rather have Central Asia selling gas and oil to China than competing with his gas and oil going to Europe. So the two sides compete, but it's a friendly competition. They know the limits. Um, what's impressed me about Central Asia over the last two decades is so many commentators predicted its demise into chaos, collapsing regimes, and none of it has happened. A number of these, except a little bit in Kyrgyzstan and Tajikistan, none of the, you know, the big states like Kazakhstan, Uzbekistan have had leadership transfers and the places have remained peaceful and they've developed real um, institutionalization that they didn't have at the time of the collapse of the Soviet Union. You've done a nice job, Bob, of painting sort of the great game, um, a different great game, right, between China and Russia over Central Asia. I'm, I'm referring now to, to Juan and Nick's question. Um, uh, and you've answered a little bit uh, about the India-China um, uh, play there. But what can the US expect from Europe in response to trying to contain China in, in the South China Sea and elsewhere? Yeah, that's a great question, John. Look, when the liberal world order came into being, in the aftermath of World War II and the creation of NATO, Europe was devastated. Um, you know, countries were impoverished, cities were in ruins, and the United States, you know, was the only major power that did not suffer any infrastructure damage during World War II. And then the 50s came along and created the suburbs and American prosperity, just as places like Germany and France were just starting to recover. Therefore, it made sense and it was perfectly logical and everybody agreed that the United States would, 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 would uphold the lion's share of the security burden. In fact, more than the lion's share, almost all the security burden. Today, you have prosperous, upper middle class societies across Europe with fantastic infrastructure, uh, getting cheap gas from Russia, uh, buying products from China, uh, playing one off against the other. And therefore, in this context, it doesn't make sense for America to pay the whole security burden. Remember, before Trump started complaining about it, Secretary of, then Secretary of Defense Robert Gates went around Europe complaining to them that if they don't pay more for their own defense, at some point there would be a crisis, a big crisis. His words were actually quite harsh when you read them now. And of course, we got the crisis in, 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 in the flavor of Trump, you know. But um, and so there's no going back to the golden age of the 1950s and 1960s. The Chinese are buying up ports, riverine ports in the center of Germany and Duisburg. They're, you know, they've basically taken over the Greek port of Piraeus. They're planning ports in Italy. They're buying up parts of the Portuguese economy. Uh, they're all over the place. 
And so are the Russians in a different way, you know, with, with their pharaonic network of natural gas pipelines uh, across Europe. So <clears throat> it's going to be also from the European point of view, the Europeans looking at us, they're not dumb. They have embassies in Washington who monitor the election results. And they had four years of Trump. And then they saw an election where the U.S. electorate was mainly divided 50-50, more or less. And, and so they have to wonder, we had four years of Trump. Can, if not Trump, some other neo-isolationist Republican be elected in four years, given how the election was not decisive in terms of being a transform, transformative uh, agenda setting um, election. So the Europeans are hedging their bets. They need China's products. They need China as a market. You know, Germany desperately needs China as a market. And they also, from their point of view, they need the cheap prices of Russian natural gas. So the alliance is not going to come back the way it was, but it can certainly be improved over what it has been the last four years, which was a parade of insults, you know, you know, extreme undiplomatic behavior. I mean, all that can change. Um, you know, Biden can make a lot of headway in a short period of time by changing the atmosphere. But I think what Trump showed the Europeans is you cannot fully trust the Americans over the long run the way we used to. And how lasting do you think that conclusion is going to be, Bob? Well, what can, what specific? The, the conclusion that you can no longer trust the United States. I, I, I assume that, that can last. I think that can be dissipated, but only if somebody else, you know, if not Biden, somebody else is elected in four years who's also normal, you know? You know, normal in the sense of alliances matter. They may not be what they used to be, but they, you know, what American power is built on more alliances than the Chinese or the Russians will ever have. If you have two terms, and it doesn't have to be the same president, and it doesn't have to be the same party, two terms of a basically normal alliance oriented presidency, I think you could undo the damage. I really, and then Trump will look like an aberration. That's hopeful. Um, we, we've got a question about uh, Erdogan and um, uh, as we think about allies, should we put Turkey on that list or not? Well, I, if, if interestingly enough, I just got back from two weeks of reporting in Turkey, um, uh, you know, where they're handling, by the way, the coronavirus better than we have been. Um, uh, so it's actually quite safe to go there. They have, um, they have a tracing system for everybody. It's really quite organized. Um, Erdogan, um, the key thing about Erdogan is his aggressions in the Middle East or throughout the Eastern Mediterranean are not driven by practical policy. They're driven by popular, by domestic populism extended into the Middle East and Eastern Mediterranean. So while it may not make sense from us looking at it from a pragmatic Turkish point of view, in terms of, you know, of driving up the emotions of his base, it's worked very well. But Turkey has painted itself into a corner where it has no allies almost. It, who are its allies? The Palestinians, the tiny Gulf state of Qatar, and the Muslim Brotherhood. Uh, um, everybody else across the Arab world is in, has become fed up with Turkey. And Qatar may, may too, because Qatar may have a rapprochement with Saudi Arabia over the next few weeks. So that would remove another Turkish ally. The Iranians are always competitors to the Turks. Um, so Erdogan in pursuing essentially domestic populism writ large across the greater Middle East has, has driven Turkey into a corner. Also, a lot has been made about Erdogan's close relationship with Vladimir Putin. The Turks actually, I learned this on my trip, 
are very, very nervous about the Russians because it's a relationship Erdogan is uncomfortable with because he has very little leverage. Uh, you, know, the, you know, he needs Russian natural gas across the Black Sea. Uh, they, they, when Russia took Crimea, it made the Russian Navy that much stronger in the Black Sea, which made Turkey very nervous. Uh, Turkey was much happier when Crimea was part of, um, was part of Ukraine. Uh, so Erdogan would actually like it if the Biden administration put pressure on Russia, got tougher on Russia. He wouldn't say that publicly, but it would be very convenient for him um, in, um, in that sense. In terms of the S-400s that they bought in violation of NATO policy uh, from the Russians, um, a few things about that that I learned. <clears throat> One is that According to the rules of the, of the purchase order, the Turks had to test the missiles at some point or else the purchase would be rescinded. But how much they tested them, whether they tested one missile or 20, was up to the Turks. And the Turks apparently have done the minimum. Um, and, 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 you know, the Turks are open maybe to a compromise here. One thing about Erdogan is he pushes and pushes, but if he sees pushback, he'll withdraw a bit. Um, remember, the Biden administration isn't wholly hostile to Turkey from Erdogan's point of view. If it puts more pressure on Russia, if it um, alleviates tension with Iran, if it's not as enthusiastic with the conservative Sunni Arabs in Israel as Trump was, that's all good for Erdogan. So Erdogan will try to get along with, um, with, with Biden the best that he can. Um, Erdogan also, it's, a, it's an incredible situation. He's been in power, John, almost 20 years. He's eviscerated the bureaucracy. He governs almost as a dictator, though he's democratically elected. But though the system still holds, and the, the mayors of Istanbul and Ankara, the two most important cities, are opposed to Erdogan. They're from the opposing party. So even though he's eviscerated institutions, it's still quite possible that he would leave office in the next two to three years through a peaceful transition of power through an election. Um, there are differences of opinion on this um, in Turkey because he's also created militias. He's eviscerated the army. The army is now all pro Erdogan. It's not the, you know, the old Turkish army that was Ataturk, secular, um, um, you know, all of that. So um, Turkey is very much in, in flux. And a very delicate policy, it, you know, because Biden can both make trouble for Erdogan in his upcoming election, re-election, and he can also ease tensions at the same time. And where can we expect to see you writing about Turkey? Uh, I'm not sure yet. It's for a book project, so I may hold it for a bit. Got it. Uh, thank you for that. We are, um, we're, we're doing pretty well at pulling in audience questions and covering the globe. I'd like to move south to Africa. Sure. And thinking both about uh, China's efforts there and whether you see an expanded American interest there under Biden. Yeah. Um, first of all, whenever I hear the word Africa, I say, what do you mean? Because there are four different Africas at last count for me. There's in greater Indian Ocean problem sphere Africa, which extends like from the Horn of Africa south to Mozambique, where you've seen a very impressive uh, creations of new middle classes and, and, and economic growth rates climbing as Africa gets pulled into this Chinese, Indian, Japanese, Indian Ocean prosperity sphere where you have in sovereign wealth funds investing in that part, from the Gulf investing in that part of Africa. Then you have Southern Africa, which has slowly become more and more of a disappointment as, the, as, as stability in South Africa doesn't, does not crumble, but it's withering. It's getting weaker and weaker. Uh, then you have Central Africa, which has made very little pro progress, and West Africa, which has been at peace, but which is very fragile, more or less, without the creation of middle classes uh, so much, or even with you know with 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 low uh, you know low level manufacturing as yet. So it's a big, vast continent. There's um, a, flaw, a flaw in thinking in Washington about Africa that the more uh, 
economic growth we see, all of a sudden all the violence and civil wars will dissipate. That's not true. If that was the case, World War I never would have happened. World War I came at the climax of the industrial age, after the creation of vast middle classes across Europe. Um, because when people become middle class, they have more wants and needs and desires. They know about their, their ethnic history much more than, uh, than in the past. You know, they, they, are, they, they fight for spoils and status and all these things that subsistence farmers do not care about or know about. So we should rid ourselves of the notion that as Africa develops, it's suddenly going to become more peaceful. It will continue to be tumultuous, though in different ways than in the past. Um, there's a lot that Biden can do in Africa. First of all, our Africa policy has been stigmatized by being just a military special forces policy. Um, and compared to that, the Chinese are winners because the Chinese build things. They build railroads, they build roads, they build mines, they build infrastructure, basic transportation infrastructure that crisscrosses the continent and, and strengthens these regimes. Also, Af the Chinese don't come armed with lectures about political morality. Um, so, and you have a lot of regimes in sub-Saharan Africa, though they're technically democracies, actually are run in a semi-authoritarian manner. And they can get along quite well with the, with the Chinese. But I think we need to lecture less and, do, and, do, and, and, and not have a one-dimensional policy you know, uh, oriented totally towards the military. Because the problem with special forces is that nobody sees them. They're out in the bush or somewhere. Whereas when you build roads and railways, people, people see them. So I think, you know, we can make quite a, there's a lot, there's a big space to fill there. And uh, we've got a good question about Venezuela and what the end state's going to be there. Can an opposition leader who holds no ground actually win? And can Biden's team influence that? The problem with Venezuela is that it is already a failed state and it has been a failed state for quite some time now. At, you, know, you know, Maduro governs greater Caracas, essentially. Uh, you know, the rest of the country is pretty much on its own with drug gangs, various militias, and other things. So there's not that much to inherit. We shouldn't assume that right after Maduro, things will get better. Uh, 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 you know, see, the definition of a really bad dictator is that he creates a situation where if you remove him, things actually get worse, not better. Um, so that you need him you know, even because he provides a minimum of order because he's eviscerated all the institutions, there's no order after him, essentially. And that's kind of the situation we are now with, with Venezuela. And uh, prospects? Uh, not, no. not good in the short run, not good. And they probably run through Cuba, frankly. Um, because, uh, you know, Cuba, you know, Venezuela has supplied Cuba with cheap energy in return. Cu the Cubans, Cuban security personnel have kept, have helped prop up the regime. So uh, it might be so that a diplomatic solution to Venezuela comes through some U.S. Cuban dialogue. And do we expect to see that progressing? Over the next well, uh, it have been reports that the Biden administration wants to warm up ties with Cuba. Uh, conservatives have opposed that viscerally in the op-ed pages of the Wall Street Journal and elsewhere, saying that, you know, this, the post-Castro regime is every bit as bad as the, the Castro regime. We shouldn't be doing them any favors, et cetera. It's a very, it's a fraught dialogue. And with, uh, with implications for Florida's electoral college vote. Exactly, I forgot to mention that, but that is true. So Bob, it, it pains me to tell you this, but, but uh, there, there's been a debate happening actually in the chat over Bob Kaplan and whether Bob Kaplan is uh, rabidly anti-Trump 
or is very even-handed and honest. And I'd like to give you the chance to demonstrate both of those. First, give, give an assessment of Trump's foreign policy successes and failures over the course of his administration. What will, uh, what will your book, uh, 10 years from now, looking back on, on Trump and, and uh, his foreign policy, how will it assess the Trump foreign policy? Sure, that's a great question. Um, first of all, Trump didn't arise out of nowhere. Uh, he may be personally distasteful, but his policies come from the pain of half of the American people. Um, remember, um, in, in the Northern Midwest, 30% fewer manufacturing jobs were created since um, China joined the World Trade Organization. So people saw that China was getting an even deal, you know, a great deal, that Washington elites supported the, you know, the status quo and helping China, and the American people didn't benefit. And Trump said enough is enough, essentially. You know, free trade hasn't benefited the average voter. I'm gonna, you know, do something about it. So Trump was an answering a cry of pain. He also was answering pain when he said you, the Europeans have gotten have been free riders for too long. You know, if they're going to buy cheap oil from Russia and have a geopolitical arrangement with Russia, why should we be supporting them? And by the way, you know, and and in turn, and why shouldn't it, we help Israel make peace agreements with with the UAE with all these other countries? So there's there's there are elements of Trump's strong elements of Trump's foreign policy that are not crazy, you know, and that the Biden administration is not going to be able to just throw out the window. Um, you know, it will have to build upon in some way, though it will not give the Trump administration credit for that. It will do so without admitting it. And this is not new. Um, when Carter replaced Gerald Ford, he built on the Helsinki process, but gave Gerald Ford very little credit for starting it, kind of. So this is common, you know? Um, so in other words, Trump was answering a logical cry of pain from the American people on various things. I mean, the, the liberal world order was great for 75 years, but that's a long time in history and inequities uh, and all kinds of in, illogic build up in any system that goes on that long. And Trump was the first one to call it out. That's the positive side of Trump. The negative side of Trump is his character. His person, you know, the way he's demeaned, in my opinion, um, the, the office of the presidency and the tenor of debate in Washington. Um, and, and, you know, there are numerous examples of this. He's just, you know, he just has too many flaws. Remember, the presidency is not like being prime minister. A prime minister runs a government. But the official, you know, symbol of the country is either, a, you know, a president like in the German system or a king or a queen in the, in the Swedish, in the Dutch or, or uh, British systems. But in America, we combine both functions. The president is both the symbolic head of the state and representative of the people in a moral sense and also the head of government. And I think Trump's character and behavior has disqualified itself from half of those responsibilities. And, and you'll be, you'd be um, pleased to know that one of the people who thought you were rapidly anti-Trump has, has uh, changed, his, uh, right, uh, 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 that, that uh, you were rapidly anti-Trump has changed his opinion. Uh, but we now have someone saying that you're very bitter, Bob, and asks why you're so bitter. I don't know what you mean. You'll have to get more specific about so, that. So, so, so that you, you, ha you have a, a um, uh, generally, uh, you, you look at problems rather than at, you, the glass is half empty for Bob Kaplan. Is that a fair assessment? Yes, it is. Um, and it's a fair assessment because before you can come up with constructive policy, you need a cold-blooded analysis of what the problems are. You can't look at places of the world with rose-tinted glasses. Uh, you know, I believe in anxious foresight, in, um, in, um, in thinking, um, you know, thinking, I mean, the founding fathers of the American Revolution 
were, they were warriors. They worried about everything that could go wrong. Just read the Federalist Papers. They were, and because they were such incessant, the classes, the glasses half empty warriors, they created a country of optimists. And a series of checks and balances. Yeah. In, intended to prevent uh, any one person from gaining too much power because they had a profoundly negative view of human nature. I would exactly. Argue. You, I couldn't have said it better. And, yeah. and, and uh, Anxious Foresight, I think, is a good name for your memoir when you end up writing it. But Bob, you, you talked about um, uh, right, some of the, the, the fact that mu much of Trump's opinions on the world were based on um, right, v valid opinions of uh, a large percentage of the American public. Did he in fact succeed in changing any of those realities? So um, the, not much, because remember populists need to solve problems. They just need problems to keep churning. You, you know, to, to keep a lot, if they solve a problem, there's no reason to be a populist and lose a lot of their power. On the China trade thing, that's a complicated economic financial issue. I, whether he changed things or not, you, you'll have to ask someone who's more of an expert on that. Um, he, you know, he hasn't really solved the problem of the, of, of, of the border between the United States and, and Mexico. That will, that will eventually require a regional strategy because, this, because of all the poverty and instability and corruption throughout Central America. So you have Central American migrants coming through Mexico to the, um, to the U.S. border. That's a regional dilemma that has to be um, dealt with. And Bob, do you think that, um, so it, as, as you noted, a deeply divided country, uh, although um, Joe Biden's um, uh, seven million vote uh, uh, total is is uh, significant, right? Certainly, I yeah, think it's of, significant I, enough. Um, um, I think the American people, John, decided. You know, we want to fire Trump, bring in Biden. It's been too crazy. But otherwise, Biden had no coattails. You know, you know, really, the Senate is evenly divided. The Republicans picked up seats in the House. I think they picked up a governorship. The Democrats couldn't flip even one legislature, if I'm correct. Um, so it wasn't, a, it wasn't an historic election in that sense. And what does that mean for Biden's chances to make significant foreign policy changes going forward? I think he'll have a lot of room in foreign policy because that's the way our system is designed. Even if a president wins by a tiny margin, he picks his foreign policy team. There's a lot he can do. Um, on foreign policy. And, um, and so I think Biden will have the leeway to, to succeed or fail, you know, or tread water in foreign policy. Domestic policy, of course, is another story, again, because of our system. I mean, so there's big implications who controls the Senate. But even if the Democrats wind up controlling the Senate, with just a 50-50 majority, they're not going to be able to do a lot of things because they'll be at the mercy of the handful of Democratic senators who are actually conservatives from red states, but who ran as Democrats. So uh, ladies and gentlemen, it's time to turn this over to Raleigh to bring it to a close. As I hope you've seen, um, and I've, I've been privileged to, to spend a, a pretty fair amount of time with Bob in a, a number of interesting settings. He is as learned, as fascinating and as humble a man uh, as, as I know. And it's been a delight to spend this time with him. Uh, I look forward as uh, the Biden team goes forward to doing more of these perhaps with Bob as we look at a world uh, from a glass half full perspective, but with a hope that we can fill the glass a little bit more through good policy and through um, informed discussions like the one we've had today. Raleigh Flynn, over to you, man. Well, thank you, John. Truly, thank you. Uh, Bob and John, I thank you, too, for both a thoughtful and thought-provoking uh, conversation. And uh, given the lot
liveliness uh, of the uh, conversation today, both both from the two of you and from our uh, pat from our audience, I I feel like I must once again say FPRI as an institution is nonpartisan, and the views of our panelists, our writers, and our scholars do not necessarily reflect FPRI, they are their own views, but we always encourage them. We are a place for thoughtful, informed discourse from all points of view. Um, and before I let everyone go, I also have to say a sincere thank you to our Mainline Series um, sponsors, John Piasecki, Jim Gately, and Eileen Rosenau, and of course to John Nagel and, and the Haverford School, who are also uh, the hosts of our Mainline Series. Thank you all for, for a great conversation, and take care, stay safe. Thank you. Bye.